four years. I, I have officiated volleyball since 1984. So that is uh, 38 years I've been officiating volleyball. So uh, what we want to do today is give young officials an overview of the basic rules of volleyball and give you some of the procedures needed to officiate a volleyball match. We have a new officials mentorship program in the SHSAA, and we want to use this in conjunction with the hands-on support you'll get from mentors in your school if you want to work matches. If you're just here to for a team and you want to learn the rules, that's also great. We're going to go through all sorts of different uh, uh, gameplay situations, rotation situations, ball handling. So we're going to get into it. Um, Evan will monitor the chat and he can, he's also a very veteran official, so he can uh, chime in whenever he wants to uh, add something. I'm going to try give hand signals. So I'll back up in my office here. It's a little weird, but we'll see how it goes. This is the first time we've tried this. So, uh, so Next slide, Jeff. So next, first thing I want to talk about is uh, warm up and coin toss procedures. Very simple. If you're official, you blow the whistle, call captains, hold up your coin. And when the captains arrive, you discuss the match. Tell them if it's two games. Is it a best of three? Are we playing triple ball? Anything like that. Um, discuss any special items about the gym. Uh, the beam rules, maybe step in on the serve. Um, anything like that that might be interesting about that particular facility, you fill them in on that. The coin toss, you flip the coin. Uh, winner chooses either serve or receive, or they can pick the side they want. And then the, the loser gets the remaining choice. Very simple. So whoever serves first in that first game, first set, they will receive serve in the second game. It's not like badminton where the winner serves. It is whoever serves in the first set receives in the second set. Uh, there's a three minute break maximum between each set. And if the third game is to be played, there's another coin toss to decide whose serve it is, or if they want the side and you call captains back up to the scorers table to make that, um, decision. So that's how we run our warm up and coin toss procedures. Uh, pretty simple. Uh, again, when your mentor official is there to help you like in all of these things they should be there to help you guide you through this and then after you do it a couple times it gets easier next One slide thing there, Graham. yep the team that is uh serving first will be the team that warms up first at the net during the yep. warm-up thank you evan that's absolutely correct and getting to that warm-up is our next slide so warm-up procedures have changed in the last few years through volleyball canada so each team gets five minutes of warm up at the net. And like Evan said, the team that will serve first gets the first five minutes at the net. Uh, you issue a warning or not a warning. You tell them when they have one minute left in the warm up because lots of teams like to serve at that time. Um, if the tournament falls behind, you can shorten warm ups to three minutes, but that is only for local tournaments and league play SHA. SHSA conferences and regionals and uh, provincial championships, which we hope some of you will be doing at some point, those all have five, five and five warmups. Um, an SHSA rule, the other team can pass the ball behind the team that is hitting. So if one team's hitting, the opposing team can be behind them and can warm up passing the ball with their coach hitting it at them, like has been done in the past. The difference is now athletes, once they hit a ball over the net, they can't go running under the net chasing it any longer because of safety issues and concussion issues. So you have to retrieve the ball outside the court or you could have fans or uh, other player, other team members uh, retrieving outside the court you can't go into the court if there's a ball there that's on the court everything should shut down until that ball is retrieved safely okay um, that is new in the last three or four years no players can pass attacks or serve during the warm-up libero is included so your libero can't be out in the middle of the court passing as well they have to be out of the court for a safety issues. So I know some of this is going to be really fast. <laughs> We're going through this quickly, but if you have any questions, make sure you add it in the, uh, in the chat. One thing to make sure it's a safety issue. So, and then you just give them a, it, Oh, you can't go under the net. And then you tell coach, say coach, they can't go under the net. And the coaches know that rule. Some of us are the older students have it's new to them. So they still have that habit of going under the net. So sometimes you have to ask them about that. Okay, so next slide we got. 
is minor official tasks. So lots of you, when you go to a tournament as a player or as a beginning official, you might be asked to minor officiate. So that means you're working as a lines person. So there's some things you need to watch for when you're being a minor official. So you need to watch for foot faults on the serve. We'll get into the actual serving rules later. We'll discuss each of these rules later on in the presentation. In and out calls on your sideline and backline. You can call those. Any contact the ball makes with the roof or hoops or speakers or walls or anything like that, a minor official can call that and touches off the block. If you see someone hits the ball off the block and the head official or uh, umpire misses it, then you can call that as well. And you should call it every time you see a touch. Um, and balls passing outside or over the antenna or into the net outside the antenna, you can also call those balls that happen there. So linesmen are very, lines people are very important. And I know lots of, of you, if you've played on volleyball teams, you've had to do it in the past. So it's something, if you do have minor officials, referees, and they're new, you might want to go over some of these things with them and tell them what you want them to look for. Okay. And you, one thing I see minor officials do in lots of league play, they stand way back from the court. They should be up in the corner of the court where the sideline meets the end line. They should be standing fairly close to that. Okay. Um, next slide. Mr. Comfort, do you, do you want to show some of those like, um, in signals? And out signals? Yeah. I didn't bring a flag with me, but <laughs> you could use a, like a pen. <laughs> sure. I got a pencil. So in is just simply down this way out with your flag is holding it straight up okay a touch you just symbol signal the such as this you and sometimes the play will be going and the or they won't see you because they didn't see the touch if the ref doesn't look at you you can wave your flag in the air and try to get their attention and say there was a touch so that's all you do okay Foot fault, if you see a foot fault on the serve, you just point, you wave your flag to get the official's attention and you just point at the back line, okay? And if it, the ball is out, you wave your flag if, if, or if it hits the roof or anything like that, you wave your flag and if they make, uh, if the official sees you, then you just give the out signal, which is one hand up in the air with your flag, okay? And your uh, referee should help you with those signals as well when you're, linesing for the first time and then the last last thing we see a common trend uh is is where those minor officials stand yeah. some stand very far back and some <laughs> almost in the court so what would we you want, recommend i would say you should be like within a meter of the court so you can see both the end line and the sideline and you can move during the rally if you need to if you know it's going to be close to the sideline you could move there but we don't want you four or five meters back in the corner, talking to a friend, checking your phone. Okay. You need to be into what you're doing there. So thank you, Mr. Kitts. Um, if the lines, for, what was that question there? Thanks, Ken. Yeah. Another thing, if you didn't see it or you don't know what happened, you can just cross your arms like this. And that means you, you can't make the call because you didn't see it. Okay. And one thing about being a lines person, if you're more authoritative on your calls, it it may it helps the official out a great deal okay any other questions there no i answered one earlier but i think we're good now okay how are we doing for time i think we're doing all right next one so we'll start getting into game procedures a little bit so uh teams should hand in their lineup after warm-up very quickly and then there's three minutes before the first set starts the starters from each team line up on the back line before the game and the start of each set, the referee blows the whistle to have team enters. You blow the whistle and you just simply put your hands together. And that means they can come in to shake hands before the set starts. And we are back to shaking hands. I think COVID protocols are no more, Jeff, or what are we doing? <laughs> I, I think there might be some, uh, we, uh, at a clinic I took in, in Moose Jaw area, they were kind of talking about, do you know, do we want to still do some of those things? So I mm -hmm. think you'll see different tournaments doing different things. You know, they might not switch benches this year just to start, get yeah. things going. They, they might continue just to do the same kind of wave instead of the handshake. So it, it'll vary from, from place to place. And I think that's okay as we ease mm -hmm. back into things. Okay. Um, does the floor captain have to be in the, 
the starting lineup? Is that what that was? No. Um, if they're in the starting lineup, do they have to be at the start of the line uh, on the baseline? And they do if they're in the lineup. Yeah. Okay. So um, after they, whatever we're doing, once we get set, uh, then we get into our positions, which we'll talk about next. And if a referee or a second official, if present, checks to make sure each team is in proper rotation. Okay, so the next slide kind of talks about proper rotation. Um, so you'll have to see a lineup card like this, and you will just get this chunk on the right side. Okay, and if you look over on the left side of this screen, we see the court positions, and it goes backwards one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, as you move around the court, it goes one, two, three, four, five, six. But then when you serve, you actually rotate in the opposite direction. Okay, so what you need to do is make sure that the corresponding person in these squares is lined up in these positions. So, for example, we have White Fox playing East End. We traveled a long way to play this game. <laughs> uh, we have uh, court positions. We have, so number one, number three should be in the back right. Number six should be in the front right. Number four should be front middle. Number 12 should be front left. Number 13 should be back left. And number eight should be in position six in the back middle. If they aren't in the right position, you just help them out. You just say number eight and 13, you got to switch. Or sometimes the, the often one will be 12 and three will be in the wrong spot. But you just, you give them that opportunity to switch positions if they need, okay? If the coach puts in the wrong player, if say number 12 is starting and he wanted number he or she wanted number 11 to start, they have to use a regular substitution to replace those in, in important games. Okay. So that's how that works. Your mentor coach or your mentor official, when you're at your games should be able to help you out a great deal with that, but it just goes, remember, you want the right person in the right spot. So number three has to be back, right. And so on, as you go around the court. Okay, and you check that on both teams and then we're ready to serve, which is our next slide. So hand signals, we go through the, like I said, as I go through the presentation, I'll try to go through the hand signal needed to make each call. Um, more assistance with hand signals will be given to you by your mentor official as well. And I have a link, maybe I can share with Mr. Kitts to send out that shows hand signals as well. So that might be forthcoming, but make sure your mentor, if you have any questions about hand signals, make sure you talk to your mentor official. Okay, next one. So game procedures. So once the lineups are checked, the ref starts play by blowing their whistle and signaling for the side to serve. So if this side of the net is serving, you blow the whistle and it's simply this motion here. We aren't doing this. We aren't doing anything fancy. Hand out, bring it to your chest as you blow the whistle. It doesn't need to be a long whistle. It's just a short blast, loud blast, so everybody knows they serve. Okay. Games go up to 25, and teams must win by two. Um, if a deciding game is played, we changed it four or five years ago that the deciding game, the third game goes to, or fifth game goes to 15, and teams switch sides at eight points. Okay. A point is awarded every serve. It's called rally point now. So every time there's a, a serve, a point is awarded. Players follow the serving order shown on the lineup sheet from positions one to six. So they rotate in the opposite direction of the, of the scorecard. Okay. When serving team wins a rally, they obviously, they serve again. The person, the person who served serves again. If the receiving team wins a rally, they rotate one position before serving. Okay. Each team is allowed two timeouts per set, and they can be no longer than one minute. All right. Each team is allowed 12 unlimited substitutions per set, and the player can only come in to their original position. SHSA has a special rule different than SVA. So if we can have 12 substitutions, but let's say number six is going in for number eight, they can go in back and forth. So number six can go in for number eight and they can go back and forth substituting in and out in those positions until 12 substitutions is reached. In SVA, you can go in, out and you're done or Volleyball Canada, but we have a special rule in SHSA to get more students playing and more students participating. So they can go in and out as many times as they can until the set's over or they've reached 12 substitutions. Okay, um, your mentor teacher can help you out with that. Um, substitution protocol too. We want 
there the coach shouldn't even be giving signals if if in a real game the if you if, uh, what we really want happening is if number six is going in for number eight as before this like after the point is done they should be in the front zone by the net by the scorers table and sh- tell the ref that they, the umpire or signal to the ref that they want a substitution okay so there's some leeway leeway there but we know we want to get those substitutes back and forth and in and out as quick as possible so talk to your mentor official about that um what's a question there um 12 subs for the entire team you can yeah. use it on two players six times or you can use it to switch your whole lineup once or i guess twice if you'd like yeah but you get 12 subs no matter who it is mm-hmm. um and then at the end of the first set when the game's over you blow your whistle go like this okay and then you do a signal and they switch sides like they used to if we are switching sides we did that last week and i ref to nipwin and they did switch sides so you switch uh the team switch around the court and they switch sides so there's no advantage and there is no switch before the third and siding set they just go to the bench and you call captains in to decide who gets to serve for the third set okay so any questions about that it's your mentor official can help you with these game procedures, but the substitution rule is very important. They can go in and out unlimited up to 12, or that's a difference than other times you may have played volleyball. So that's a good rule for the SHSA, and we hope we keep it in there. <laughs> and, and I think you touched on this a little bit, Graham, but you know, the substitutions have gone to like a quick sub rule. Mm-hmm. So you, you don't need to spend a lot of time trying to get someone's attention. You, you need to make sure that your sub from the bench is ready to go. They enter that sub area um, and then are, are called in. So mm-hmm. we don't, yeah, go Evan. Also, if you're doing two or more subs, have two or if it's three players, all go to that sub zone. The first player would come in and have the other two just waiting at the attack line. Okay. Next slide, please. So we'll get more into rules here. That's kind of the game procedures. But um, as we go into rules of volleyball, so some serving rules that sometimes are uh, forgotten or sometimes we, we, we're not sure of. Um, I'll let you answer that, Evan. Servers, you have eight seconds to serve the ball once the whistle is blown. So if you are the official, you kind of count to eight in your head. Okay. Um, it's okay to give someone a warning. Like if you see them come around, you can tell the captain, okay, that person on your team is getting really close to eight seconds. It doesn't get called very much because eight seconds is quite a long time, but they only have eight seconds to serve. If it takes longer than that, you blow the whistle. It's a fault and it's a side out and lots of point and the other team gets to serve a new rule. Since the invention of the uh, jump serve and spike serve, Servers can only toss the ball once. If they don't complete the serve in the first toss, it's a side out and loss of serve. And you'll see this in junior games lots of times when uh, they haven't, the skills aren't that strong. They'll throw the ball up and then they'll catch it. Okay. That is a loss of serve. Okay. You cannot do that anymore because what was happening, people would, for their spike serve, they'd throw it up in the air and they'd throw it bad. And they would just let it land because they could do that. And some people were taking two or three attempts to hit the volleyball for the serve. Um, so that is not allowed. Once you toss the ball in the air, you could bounce the ball. You can move it from hand to hand. But as soon as you throw it up in the air in any kind of motion like that, you have to contact the ball with one hand. Okay, you can be underhand, sidearm, overhand. Okay, but you must con- contact it with one hand hand only okay there was a question when does the eight seconds start um eight seconds starts once the official blows the whistle and make sure if the ball's in the corner and the fit and the server does not have the ball in their hands yet don't blow the whistle until they have the ball in their hands okay they cannot because if we're or if there's something going on in the court Make sure this, everybody's ready before you serve. You want to make sure you scan the court, both sides, make sure there's no timeouts being called, no shoelaces being tied up, no ball from another court coming on the court. You want to make sure everything's clear before you blow in that your whistle to, to signal serve, okay? Um, 
if, for example, you're going, you blow in the serve and then another ball comes in from another court or you notice something else has happened is you can blow the whistle again and it's a reserve, okay? And the signal for reserve is two thumbs up, okay? Um, the next rule, so they can only toss it once, their foot must be completely behind the end line and they must be between the side, line, side lines extended as the ball is contacted. So no part of the foot can touch the line, okay? They can, if they're doing a jump serve or spike serve, they can jump from behind the line, be in the air, hit the ball and land in the court. As long as when they contact the ball, they are, uh, they're not, they haven't landed in the court already. So they cannot touch any part of the, that line when they're, when they're serving. Okay. They can land in the court as long as they contact it while they're in the air and have taken off behind the line. Graham, can you yep. show the procedure for eight seconds? Like what the signal would be? What is the signal, Evan? I haven't called it in a long time. Eight seconds? Eight, eight seconds. Yeah. Show eight yeah. fingers. Yeah. Okay. So, and if you notice, so if that happens, eight seconds, what you can do if it's close and the person loses their serve, as they come around, you can just say, hey, number seven, you're getting really close. Or you can tell their coach or you can tell their team captain, number seven is getting really close to eight seconds. Like you can help them out and make sure they know that they're taking too long. Because it's probably not the first time they've been called. Because if people take a long time, lots of people have a routine when they serve, and sometimes they get a little, uh, they get take too long. So we got to make sure we, we're calling that, but give them a little bit of leeway. But they can't be 10, 11, 12, 13 seconds, and make sure you mention it to them. Um, one rule we have in SHSAA opposing team is not allowed to yell or try to distract the server. Um, as a person is going through the process of serving, the other team can't be yelling spin or float or uh, anything that tries to distract them. That's an SHSA rule, okay? So they're not allowed to do that. And again, you offer a warning um, and you make sure you involve your mentor official if that is happening, okay? This is a rule that took change in the 80s. <laughs> the opposing team may not attack or block a serve. So if you have a person in the front row and they serve, they can't go up to attack the ball, play it above the net, either an attacking motion or in a blocking motion. That is not allowed. Okay. And the ball may touch the net while legally crossing it. So if it, if it goes between the attack lines and it ticks the top of the net and goes into the opposing team's court, that is a legal serve, okay? There used to be a time when if it touched any part of the net on the serve, it wasn't allowed. But now if it touches the net and falls into the opposing court, it's a good serve and they must play the ball, okay? Any questions on those serving rules? The biggest ones are the, the one that gets called the most is the foot fault, all right? So make sure if, and some of our gyms are small or when you go cross court, we see step in rules. So we got to make sure we are communicating with the teams what the actual step in serve rule. Um, serve receive rotation. So this can get a little tricky. Uh, at the moment of serve is contacted, all players must be in their correct positions. So there's six positions on the court. If when serve receive, when the serve takes place, they must be in their correct position. So we have some diagrams in the next coming later that'll help you out with this, but each back row player must be positioned behind the corresponding front row player. So, uh, and then I'm going to go through these quickly and then I'm going to show you on the rotation cards, what has to happen. The front and back row players respectively must be positioned side to side in proper order. Okay. And we'll go through that in the definition or in our, uh, with our diagrams. It is the position of the feet on the floor as the ball is contacted that determines if it is their incorrect rotation. So sometimes you'll see one person standing up passing and the setters beside them, their feet are behind them, but they're leaning over. That's okay. As long as their feet are behind the front row player's feet, that is a legal action. If the back row player's feet are in front, when the ball is contacted, that is a a rotation violation and when you call that you blow your whistle and it's just simply a circle like that okay out of rotation um here's the interesting thing though it's uh if a server 
is going to make their serve and they step on the line, that takes precedent over if the other side of the net was out of rotation. Okay, that happened first. They did not complete their serve. So that takes precedence first. Or if they have a time violation and the other team is out of rotation, that server error would be the one that counts and it would be a side out and a point for the other team. If, and this happens lots of times, if the person serves as they, they hit their serve and the ball's heading towards the opposition side and the other team is out of rotation, that, um, that is the fault that takes place. So what happens sometimes, the serve will happen, the other team's out of rotation, the umpire calls out of rotation, and then the serve hits the roof or hits the net or goes under the net or out. It's still the receiving team's penalty. Once that serve is made legally and it's in the air, then it's the uh, rotation call that takes precedence. So that's pretty high level officiating, but you might see that and it's something you need to know and make sure you have any questions or about that, you talk to your mentor official, okay? So I think we have some diagrams coming up here. Um, so there's the court position. So what I talked about before, the server is in position one. So if we talk about on, that's a server. And on the other side of the net, it's the same thing. They got, they're in those positions. So if you look at this, when the ball is contacted, number player number in position one must be behind player two. Number six must be behind player three. And number five must be behind player four. Num here's the weird thing. <laughs> number five can be in front of number three. This is hard to describe without being on the court, but uh, number five can be in front of number three. The only person that matters as far as going in front or behind is the person directly in line. So five and four, uh, five must be behind four, six must be behind three, and one must be behind two. Side to side, five must be on the left side of six when the serve happens. Six must be on the left side of one. Okay, and four must be on the left side of three and three must be on the left side of two. So if we go to the next slide, Jeff, we have some uh, actual things. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to jump in. We got a lot yeah. of di dialogue going on yeah. in the chat that probably doesn't need to be going on. Yeah. And I know it's probably some people know each other and maybe you could just text each other on the side or something. But uh, Evan's doing his best to try and answer a lot of questions. And uh, so, yeah, if you could just slow down on some of the extra dialogue, that would help out. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. So this is a, this is a uh, tough thing about officiating, but if we look at this one, these diagrams here from the rule book. So the front row player has the, and the back row players in blue. So when, if you look at the first one, when the ball is hit, uh, if the ball is hit, when they are in this in the left side here, you'll see it says correct because the front row player is their feet are ahead of the back row players. If you look at the second one here, they're exactly even or the blue one's a little ahead. That is a violation. Their right foot is ahead of the left foot players. That is a violation. Okay. And if you look at the far right, it's definitely over and it's when the ball is contacted. This happens most of the times when you see this, this type of scenario is when a setter is coming in from the back row and they're cheating and they're coming in too early. And uh, oftentimes when we play volleyball all year long, there is no umpire and the, the referee is watching the server serve. So the, sometimes the setters will take liberties and cheat a little bit and leave a little early, but by rule, when that ball is contacted by the server, the receiving team, that, that uh, back row player must be behind the front row player. Okay. When it's contacted, um, warnings are good. Like as well, if you see someone's just cheating a little bit, <laughs> Hey, number six, you're leaving early and they will, they know they are generally they'll look at you and smile and say, okay, I'll watch it again. So, uh, let's go to the next slide. We've got a, some more examples. So here is Everybody take a look at this. So the front row has got the colored shoes and the back row is in the clear shoes here. And I've also included, if you look, I've included the rotation order up here. So what we need to look at here, number one and number two, 
number one must be behind number two. So in this scenario, number one is behind number two. That's good. Okay. Number three, number six must be behind number three. That's good too. Okay. And let's look at side to side here. Number one is to the right of numbers of position player in position six. That's good. Player in position six is to the right of the player in position five. That is also good. Okay. But where we get some trouble here, uh, number four and number five, do we see an issue here? Number five must be behind number four. So number four is way behind number five. So this is an outer rotation call. If it was, if there was a second official, they would call this. This would be the umpire's job to call. Okay. Uh, but if it's, if you're working by yourself as a referee, you can call it for sure. Okay. But in this one, this is, this team is out of rotation because number four is behind number five. Everything else is fine. So all that would need to happen if you, number four, if they moved up to two meters ahead, that would be fine. But this one's out of rotation. Let's look at the next one, Mr. Kitts. It's a very common one. This rotation right here. If you look, this is a legal serve receive, even though there's players all over the place. And uh, the only thing that has to happen, one is behind two. That's good. Okay. Uh, six is behind number three. That's good. Okay. Five is below number, uh, behind number uh, position four. That's good. Okay. And we go side to side now. You'll see. Number one is to the right of number six. All good. Number five is to the left of number six. Number six to the right. So these people are in order side to side. All right. And number two is to the right of number three. Number three is barely to the right of number four, but they're far enough. Okay. And number four is to the left. So this is a good serve receive. And this person here in position five will often be the setter. Okay. But they can go all the way to the player number six there and still be legal as long as they're not to the right of number six so there's different ways coaches can can line up their teams okay but and it's something you need to be aware of and as you ref more and more you'll get to see uh you get used to what rotations people are playing and that kind of stuff but that's the basic rules okay you have to be behind the player that is directly in front of you so one and two one must be behind two six must be behind three five must be behind four Okay. That's, it's much easier to show on if we were in a gym, <laughs> we would be people leading people around and showing you how to do it. But remember the rotation call is out, you blow the whistle and you just do a circle like that. That's out of rotation. One, one of the hardest thing, ones to understand and especially through a virtual clinic, but yeah, th I appreciate the drawings there. Yeah. They look like deer tracks, but here's one that's interesting. Okay. This one is a legal serve, even though the only time that uh, side to side doesn't matter. So if you look at this one, uh, position two, three, and four are all fine. They're, they're the serving team. They're standing at the net. The only thing you see here is the server is in position one and number six is to the right of the server. That's okay. This, the server can go anywhere along the back line. They do not count when it comes in terms of rotation. Okay, the server can serve from the sideline to sideline. They don't matter in terms of rotation when they contact the ball. Okay, so number six can position themselves anywhere in the court as long as they're behind number two and to the right of number five. So that's kind of an, an interesting one. The server can go anywhere along the back line. They don't count in terms of rotation when they're serving. Okay, next one. How are we doing for time? We'll get 25 minutes. I think we're going to be okay, Mr. Kitts. So um, ball in and out. We're going to talk about back row setters and all that kind of stuff later, everybody. So if you just be patient, we'll get to that kind of stuff. I see some of that popping up on the chat. Okay. So balls in and out of play. A ball is considered in if any part of the ball lands in contact with the court and the lines in volleyball are considered in. So if it lands on the line, it is in, okay? A ball is out if it goes over the net outside or directly over the antenna. You'll see that called all the time. Someone will be outside the court by the bench and they swing and it goes outside the antenna to the opposing, opposing court. That is uh, a violation or a fault. So 
when we do, uh, when a ball's in and you're the official, you blow the, you blow your whistle, you point to the team that won the point, and then it's simply one arm down is in. So you point, bring this arm back and point down that the ball is in. Okay. If a ball is out, the team either hits it out or it goes outside the antenna. You blow the whistle. You point at the team that has won the point and will be serving. It's simply like that. And then an out call is as an official is two arms right in front of you, 90 degree angles, fairly close together. We don't want them out here. We don't want it down here. We don't want way up kind of right in front of your head. That is the out call. So we have the in call is you point and you don't point at the ball when you're calling an in call, you just point in the direction of the side. So let's do that again. If let's say uh, East end spikes the ball and it hits inside the court and the ball's in, you'd blow your whistle. You'd point at East end. Okay. That they're getting the point. Then you just point kind of at the, where the attack line meets the sideline on your side. And that, signals that the ball is in you don't point to the back corner you don't point down the sideline you just do kind of a general move that the ball was indeed in okay and you can take your time on those we don't want you going if you see me here you don't want to be going their point in okay that's not how we do it in volleyball officiating you make sure it's a clear motion so this team gets a point that's the first signal and then you signal that the ball was in or you might signal this team gets the point and the ball was out Okay. Uh, the ball is out if it hits any object outside the courts, like ceiling, wall, speakers, basketball hoops, anything like that. And that is simply, there's no T, TP call or like this call anymore. If the ball, you blow the whistle, point to the team that's won the point, and that is out. If it hits anything around the gym, is considered out. Okay. Um, So here's an example of the, the legal area where the ball can, come, can go over the net. So if you look here, all the areas in black, if the ball hits outside the antennas on the net, it's out. If it goes under the net, obviously, that is a fault. If it goes, if it hits the antenna, it is out. If it goes over the antenna, it is out. So the signal, if, if you know that the ball goes out over the antenna or outside the antenna, you simply blow your whistle loudly, point to the team that gets the point, and then it is out. Or if the ball hits the standard or hits your ref stand or hits you, you blow the whistle, <laughs> point in the direction, and it is out. Okay? What Another thing that often happens is someone will hit a ball hard and person will shank the pass. So they'll go to pass it. It hits, the, hits them and goes up and hits the roof. You can, you can call that is called a touch. So you call the East end gets the point and that signal for touch is this. Okay, here's a signal for a touch. And if it's this point, if White Fox got the point, it'd be this way. And because they touched it out. Okay, that's the signal for that. We'll get into the, when we get to blocking, we'll talk about that a bit more. So make sure the ball has to pass up above. So here's ball handling. So a rule change of about a decade or 15 years ago is the ball can touch any part of the body. It used to not be able to be touched below the waist, but now you can touch it with any part of your body as long as the contact is clean. Each team is allowed to contact the ball three times on their side of the net. Here's a rule that everybody needs to know. On the first contact, if it happens simultaneously, you can hit the ball twice. So if you are playing the ball on your first contact and it's like like that, like it, that's okay. If it hits you in the, if it goes through your hands and hits you in the head, that's okay. You can do that. It's it's as long as it's the first contact. Of course, you can't set the ball and then bump the ball. That would be too simultaneous. But the first contact, you can hit the ball twice. Two hits is is allowed so if it gets really kind of a bad a throw that's a different thing you cannot catch the ball on the first contact but you can hit it twice on the first contact okay that's something everybody needs to know because i see that called all the time someone will hit make a really bad set on a serve generally and it'll <laughs> kind of bad sounds but if it's a first contact that's okay all right um 
The next one, you are not allowed to catch the ball and then send it. You'll see a catch. Oftentimes, lots of times it'll happen at the net. The ball hit the net and people just scoop it up with two hands. Okay. Or they'll set it really low and throw it. It's a very difficult call to catch. We'll give you the signals for those. So if, if we have, well, we're going to talk about two hits, but if it is a catch, okay, let's say White Fox setter has call a uh, carry. All right. They would be simply, uh, so East end's ball and the signal is a carry. So you just lift your hand straight up like that. Okay. That would be the carry call. After the first hit, you cannot contact it twice. So if we have ugly sets or goes to, if, if you contact it twice or it goes through your hands and hits you on the head on the second and third contact, that's not allowed. You simply blow the ball, the play dead, point at the team that's winning, and then it's two hits. Okay. You just give the signal for two. All right. Um, if two teammates contact the ball at the same time, it counts as two of the team's three hits. Okay. So then they have to only one more hit to get it over. And obviously no player can contact the ball twice in a row. So you can't bump it and set it yourself. That's self-explanatory. Um, another thing, let's say you can't grab onto your teammate and assist them while they're playing the ball. You or you can't like, for example, you can't like push them up in the air to get them higher so they can spike. You can't assist them as they're playing the ball at any time. But the ball handling is one of the toughest calls you have to make. And, uh, but just remember if it's really obvious uh, after the first hit, like two hits, that's a signal. And if a carry, it's just this. And carries will often happen at the net or the, the setter throws it or one hand or lots of times we see. Uh, carries when they go to tip the ball and they catch it and they bring it back and they kind of give it a throwing motion that is a fault so you blow your whistle point the side that gets the that gets the point bring your hand back and then it's a carry okay uh next one is net play and under the net so if we Here's the rules for net play and under the net. So no player on either side can touch the net between the antennas when they're playing the ball. So if you're spiking the ball or blocking the ball, you cannot touch the net, okay? Anywhere on the net. If your stomach or your hip hits the bottom of the net, that's illegal. You can't hit the top of the net, the tape or anywhere in between. So if you're playing the ball, you cannot touch the net, all right? Between the antennas. Uh, if two players on opposite teams touch the net at the same time, it's a reserve. So if it sometimes happens, the ball is really tight or they both swing at it and they both hit the net simultaneously, you'd blow the whistle and you'd give the reserve signal and the person player that served would serve again. Okay. If the ball is driven into the net and touches the opponent, so you're standing there blocking and the ball hits the net and the ball pushes the net into you, that is legal. Okay, if the ball pushes the net and you do something like this and hit it to the side, that is illegal. You cannot do that. So the signal for touching the net is you'd blow the whistle. If East End touches the net, it'd be White Fox ball. You point at them, they get the point, and then you just little chopping motion to the post. You don't do this or just one motion to the post. Okay, you don't point at the person. Oftentimes the coach will ask who was on the net and you can tell them what number the player was if you noticed what number it was, okay? But they cannot touch the net while they are uh, playing the ball, okay? If, on the other hand though, where am I here? Let's see, sorry for a sec. Um, if to say the setter, this sometimes happened, the setter that plays way far away and there's a player and the, the player turns and they're not playing the ball and their ponytail hits the net, that is not a net fault. If they're not playing the ball, it's not a net fault. Okay. But anytime they're in the act, even if they, they swing and they're landing and they're flying around <laughs> trying to save themselves and they hit the net, it's still in that continuous action. Anytime they hit the net, that is a fault. Okay. That, that is always been the rule. Another thing that is very important is uh, a foot fault. Okay. A player's foot cannot pass completely under the net. So there's a center line in most gyms. There's a solid center line. The uh, opposing player's foot cannot pass completely into the opposing zone. And that's the sole of the foot, the bottom of the foot. Okay. It has to be completely in. You can straddle the line. You can be on the line. You can be on your toe. 
with your toe up in the air, as long as the sole, if you put it back down, would be on the line. But if it's all the way across the line, that is a fault and that is blown dead. And all you do for that call is you blow the whistle. If East End is over the line, you point towards White Fox and then you just put your finger and point it at the middle line. You don't go like this along the line. You just point at the middle line under the net, okay? Um, another thing that's interesting is you can, uh, outside the antenna, you can touch the net. If you are, like, you can't, if, if the balls, if you save a ball outside the antenna and you crash into the ref stand or happen to hit the net outside the antenna or your feet go under the net outside the antenna, outside the uh, sideline, that's okay. You can do that. Okay. It's just inside the antennas, inside the sidelines, which is a rule that lots of people don't know. You can uh, use that for support. Even if you're crashing, you can save yourself. Okay. Uh, but in between the antennas, that's not allowed. The attack hit is uh, anytime a player sends the ball into the opposing court, it's an attack hit. Even if they bump it over or set it over, or tip it over, it's still considered an attack hit if they're playing it to the other side. Here's, here's what we're talking about. The very important rules are only front row players can attack the ball above the height of the net in the front zone in front of the attack line. So you have to be in position two, three, or four in order to be able to spike the ball above the height of the net. Okay. Back row players, they can complete an attack hit above the height of the net if they take off with both feet completely behind the three meter line and it's extended. So you'll see some gyms have the sideline, they'll have little staggered dots outside the attack line. You can jump from behind that. Okay. And if, if as long as you take off completely behind that line, hit the ball and you can land in the front zone, that's fine. It's where your feet are when you take off. Okay, so back row players can complete an attack hit uh, above the height of the net as long as they take off with both feet behind the line. Uh, you'll see the two times you'll see this the most and is when uh, a setter will be in the back row and they'll forget they're in the back row and they'll go up and they'll tip it over because the set's tight. Okay, and the other time you'll see it is a back row player takes off and their foot goes on the line. They jump and complete the attack hit. And the call for that is if White Fox commits that foul you'd go blow your whistle you'd point at east end and then it's simply this move here back row attack okay you just tilt your arm to the side uh so uh, a back row player can can obviously a back row player can bump the ball over from the front zone as long as when they con or set it over as or swing at it as long as when they contact the ball, the ball is below the net. That's legal, okay? Uh, blocking, only front row players can block, obviously. Okay, if the ball hits the block, it does not count as the first contact, no matter how many players are involved. So sometimes if you see a triple block and it bounces off two of those players, that does not count as one of the team's three hits, okay? So if a ball hits the block, it's not counted. The first hit after the block can be executed by any player, including the one who's touched the ball during the block. So if you go up and block and it comes down the net, you can still play it as the first contact. That's legal, okay? Uh, sometimes people forget that or it's called. It has to be a blocking motion though. Sometimes the person will be up to block, okay? And they're coming down and they're landed and then they set the ball into the net and then they bump it up. That isn't allowed. It has to be during that blocking motion, okay? Uh, obviously, only front row players can block. It's a, if uh, you can penetrate into the opponent court. This is the only time you can penetrate into the opponent's court as long as you don't interfere with the attack hit. So you ever watched Olympic volleyball, the men and ladies there, they are like literally right over the net when they're attacking the ball. That's okay as long as you're not interfering with that attack hit, okay? Um, Obviously, if blockers are on the net, it's the same call as if an attacker was on the net. You simply blow the whistle, white fox is on the net, so East End gets a point, and the sig signal is just touch the net. All right? So blocking is kind of interesting. Let's go to the next one. I think this is our last slide. How are we doing for time? Am I going too fast, Mr. Kitts? No, I think you're doing good. And, and thanks, Evan, covering a lot of questions in the chat. <laughs> yeah. I think one that he was just talking about, and maybe Evan wants to jump in, is 
questionable block in the setter. So uh, you, you do see that when people maybe block second contact or, or those things. Evan, go ahead. Yeah, if they're setting up to set a player for the hit, you cannot block that set if it's on their side of the court. But if the setter is setting the ball to push it over the net, then yes, you can block that because it's considered an attack hit. But no, you can't block a set intended to be hit, assuming it stays on their side of the court. If the setter makes a bad set and sets it over the net, then yes, you can then hit that or block it. The ball has to be completely still on the side of the net where the setter is. So if they go into play, they go into play that ball. You can't reach way over and interfere in that set for sure. But if they are playing an attack, and all of a sudden the setter turns and tries to dump it or something like that, you can go up and attack the ball. But you can't block. Let's say the person goes up to swing, and as they're swinging, your block is way over the net, and you touch the ball before they contact it. That is that is not legal. That is a fault. Okay, you can't do that. Uh, any other questions on that? Lots of good questions. So, the are you talking about libero now? Are we on this one, Evan? Yeah, that's what they're wondering about is the libero. Okay. So, lots of interesting rules regarding the libero. We can use one libero in SHSAA games. You can change. So, in set one, number eight is the libero. And in set two, number 13 can be the libero. Okay, but during the game, if number seven is a libero, they can only be the libero for that. For You can't substitute a libero. Graham, do you okay. want to just explain what a libero is before okay. you get into all the rules sure. about it? Yeah, the libero is a, is a back row specialist is the best way to describe it. Okay, they come in and pass for uh, players in the back row. And you don't have to worry about substitutions with them. They can just run in and out and they can replace any player in the back row. Uh, we'll talk about some of those things, but the libero is just kind of free. They wear a different colored jersey or bib or t-shirt or whatever they're wearing. And they are simply, they simply play in the back row. And because they're in the back row, they have some special rules that are, uh, that concern only the libero. So if you go back to our lineup card, you'll see a little corner. You want to race way back up there, Jeff. It's like slide, uh, slide number seven. You want to go back to slide seven, if you could. So if you look here, on our maybe one yeah they're right here you look you see on the white fox side of this card there's a box for libero there okay you must designate your libero before the set okay and that's the only person that can be libero for that set is number seven you cannot substitute a libero all of a sudden number 13 can't be the libero okay and Liberos are recorded on the lineup card. They must wear a different colored jersey. The libero leaves the court. They must wait one point before returning to play. So let's say the front, it's usually lots of times liberos go in for middle hitters. So let's say the libero goes in, uh, is leaves the court because the rotation has taken place and the person they replaced is now in the front row. The libero cannot stay in the front row. They have to leave. There has to be one entire point played before the libero can come back in. Okay. They can't go in and run back in in the same. There has to be one distinct point. Okay. Does that make sense, everybody? You can't, there must be one point before they can come back in. They can replace any back row player. It doesn't matter. Okay. They can replace a player at the start of the set. So oftentimes when you do the lineup card, you'll, you'll go through number three, six, four, 12, 13, eight, and then you'll look at the libero and you just do this. They can, that means you can now swap. It's now time for you to come in. Okay. So the libero places their player. All right. Um, the libero cannot serve or block. So libero cannot serve or block at any time. And here's the two most important rules about liberos, besides the one that they have to wait one point before they come in. A libero cannot execute an attack hit if the ball is above the height of the net from anywhere on the court. You remember earlier, back row players can attack a ball if they take off from behind the attack line and land in the front court. A libero cannot hit the uh, ball above the net any point on the court. Okay, the reason they don't that rule is in there. If you had someone that was really good back row hitter, he would be he or she would be your libero for the whole game, and they could swing out of the back row all game. So they're not allowed to attack the ball above the height of the net. They can stand and hit a down ball. That is 
fine. You, they can do that. Okay. They can bump the ball over the net. That is also fine. If the libero jumps and hits the ball above the height of the net, it is simply you blow the whistle. So if East End does that, it'd be White Fox ball and it's a back row attack, a legal attack for the libero. So that's one that you can see sometimes. The one you also see is if the uh, libero sets the ball in the front zone. So let's say libero's in right close to the net in that front three meters ahead of the attack line and they set the ball with their fingers. If the libero sets the ball, their teammate cannot jump and hit the ball above the height of the net. Lots of people don't know that rule, but if the libero can bump the ball, if they're in the front zone, they can bump the ball up. That's fine. But as soon as they set the ball in that front zone, the attacker cannot jump above the height of the net and contact the ball. They have to, they can obviously stand and they can hit a down ball. They can set it over. They can bump it over, but they cannot contact the ball above the height of the net. Does that make sense to everybody? Evan, you want to explain that a little differently, maybe two ways. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't focusing on what you were saying. You only got questions. You had 99 questions in the chat, Mr. Rostotsky. <laughs> so what uh, what we're saying there? So the two big rules about the libero: they have to, they cannot uh, jump above the net and hit the ball, and secondly, they cannot set the ball in the front zone. The re, the ra, like for the first one, I said if you had your best back row hitter, they could stay in the game, the back row all game, and just whale away from the back row yeah. secondly you could put your setter as your libero and they could go into the front zone from the back and set all game from the back row and you'd always have three hitters in the front so that's why that rule is there you cannot be a setter or you cannot set the ball from the front zone if you're the libero they can bump it that's fine that's that's okay um, um any more Graham, questions can you answer the question from emma there about the rotating the libero i'm answering a different question at the moment okay what Right at the end. So when rotating, you just skip the libero and leave them in their spot. Uh, when rotating. I don't understand the question, I don't think. Sure. So is that at the start of the game or? I don't know what that question is. So the one thing that make, often what you'll see when liberos are coming in and out, you'll see all of a sudden um, the libero, there'll be a late switch. So when rotating, you just skip the libero and leave them in their spot. I don't know what that. I'm, I don't know what that one is. But oftentimes, you got to give the libero. You can give them a warning if it's a late substance. Like sometimes, all of a sudden, the middle player will be, or the libero will be going to the front row, and this should be. They'll be waiting for the middle to come in. You have to give them some time to make that switch. Okay, Graham. I think Emma's asking like, uh, if the libero comes in, would they stay in? position six and everybody would rotate around and they would they would actually go in for that position and then rotate through and then would come out before heading into the front row yeah you stay in that the person you replace you stay in their position and rotate as they would as you go through the back row yeah, yeah. thanks for that's a good question yeah um second officials we didn't really touch on second officials but uh one thing when we talk about second officials they call pretty well everything except ball handling they can call pretty well everything except ball handling um that is the uh officials that is the head official's job to call two hits or a carry all right but you can help them out sometimes they can't see like if the back the setter's back is to the person you might just give them a little signal <laughs> but uh that's that's about it um any other questions I, I know that was a real fast one hour, but we're done an hour. Holy 506, Mr. Kitts. Yeah. No, uh, like I said at the start, we will we'll try and connect those that are interested in officiating with their district officials, commissioners. Uh, somebody asked about paid. Typically, you are paid to officiate volleyball. It'll depend uh, where you are. If they, sometimes people pay in food and, and drinks. But yes, it is typically a paid uh, position. And I do just want to thank Graham and, and Evan, fast fingers, Evan on the chat and, and Graham for going through an hour and, and everybody for taking some time to come to the first annual uh, youth officials volleyball clinic. And, and we want to wish you all the best this season. If you're on a team or if you're officiating or what you're doing, uh, we hope you enjoy the volleyball season for the next couple months. Take care and uh, good luck. Thanks very much, everybody.